after the most excruciating weather delay I can remember in all my years of being a NASCAR fan, we got a summer night race at Homestead Miami Speedway, and it was something else, something different. How's it going y'all? My name is Eric and welcome to Out of the Groove. I did not expect to be filming and editing this video so late. Today's race was supposed to be run at 2.30 in the afternoon. I just remember there was an Xfinity race this morning. It feels like days ago because today's race literally took all afternoon and all night. We're gonna talk about the cup race at Homestead Miami Speedway today. We're gonna talk about the top finishers, the winner, some of the drama at the end of this race, the drama throughout this race, and of course at the very end I'll put this thing on my groovy gauge. It's a typical race review episode, but let's start with the weather delay that had everybody groaning for several hours. The beauty of South Florida weather in the summertime, or should I say the curse in this case. There's a reason why NASCAR never runs at Homestead Miami Speedway in like June. The reason they're doing it this year obviously is due to extenuating circumstances, but there's a reason this race was originally scheduled for March and why for years the race was scheduled for November. Because in this time of year, it rains pretty much every day in Florida, pretty much all across the state, and it's extremely unpredictable. And that's what we saw here today with uh, only a brief bit of rain actually hitting the track, but pop-up thunderstorms near the track sent us into multiple lightning delays. NASCAR has a lightning policy. That means anytime there's a strike of lightning within eight miles of the track, they have to pause the race, red flag it for at least 30 minutes. But every time there's another strike, they have to restart that clock, restart that clock. And we ran into that trouble today and it was excruciating. There was one point after we'd been sitting for over an hour that it looked like car covers were coming off. Drivers were getting into their cars when another lightning strike hit within that radius and it put us into another delay. It was Oh, painful during the separate delays because at one point NASCAR was able to actually run about five laps before they had to red flag it again. Uh, I went and ran some errands. I got some food. I did a live stream with you guys, which was a lot of fun. So I had a very full afternoon, but it was still very painful not knowing when they were going to go green, not knowing what really was going on behind the scenes. I want to give credit to Mike Joy, Jeff Gordon, Larry Mack, everyone at Fox, because for the first roughly two, two and a half hours of this delay, they stayed on the air and were continuing to do live content. They were interviewing drivers via Skype. They were showing old radioactive. And honestly, I much prefer that to what they often do during long rain delays where they just go show like a replay of the race a year ago or, you know, they'll go show one of their long specials, an hour long special about Charlotte or whatever. They did a little bit of that today. They were showing like the Davey Allison special, but they only did that at the very end of the delays after like the third lightning delay hit. Then they were finally like, okay, throw in the towel. Let's show some reruns. But up to that point, I thought it was cool because they gave several drivers. I saw Corey LaJoy get an interview on Fox drivers who maybe aren't always on camera, on screen, getting talked about. I thought it was nice to see a lot of those guys on camera and getting the chance to show their personality, especially right now when it's no secret that there are at least some newer eyeballs tuning into NASCAR right now that maybe have not seen much or any racing in the past. So it's good for them to see more faces, put more you know names to numbers, to paint schemes and all of that. I think that's great to, to showcase more of the drivers during this delay, making the most of the situation. So credit to Fox and the broadcast team for, for doing that for most of the delay today. But yeah, the delay sucked. Anyway, let's not talk about delays anymore. Let's actually talk about the race because this was the first race in years that was run at Homestead Miami Speedway where we did not crown a NASCAR championship. Champion. And if we look at the top finishers, maybe that's why it's no surprise Denny Hamlin got the win. I kid, I kid. The joke is that Denny Hamlin's never won a cup championship. He's notoriously had a couple bad moments at Homestead that have cost him championship runs in the past. I mean, just last year, his team made a mistake on pit road and over Justin on the car, and that really ruined his chance of winning last year's championship. But this year, with a little bit less on the line, perhaps, Denny Hamlin gets the win. It's his third of the year. It's also his 40th of his career, which actually passes Matt Kenseth, breaks a tie he had with with Matt Kenseth and moves him now into the top 20 on NASCAR's all-time wins list. He's tied with Mark Martin now. The race ended with a very long green flag run. Denny Hamlin led for most of the start of stage three, but then Chase Elliott's team was able to leapfrog the 11 car during green flag pit stops. Hamlin was able to close back in on Elliott, and then we'll talk about this in a moment, but thanks to some lap traffic, perhaps, he was able to get by Chase Elliott and then spent the last 30 laps or so holding off Elliott as Elliott did not let him get away. He was never within uh, further than a few car lengths behind Denny Hamlin. So close racing, uh, competitive racing, and good job by Denny Hamlin to not make any mistakes, not throw this race away. He had to be pretty much perfect for for the last 30 laps and uh, he more or less executed. So well done, Denny Hamlin. He is carrying the banner for Joe Gibbs Racing this year, a team with two former champions, Martin Truex and Kyle Busch. Busch has zero wins still in this e this season. Martin Truex finally won you know, earlier this week at Martinsville, but he was off the pace tonight compared to the other Joe Gibbs cars. So Denny Hamlin with his three wins, including of course the Daytona 500, he has been the face of Toyota this year. And right now he looks like a championship contender while his teammates continue to be inconsistent week in, week out. And this is weird. 
weird. Denny Hamlin's really freaking good, but usually Kyle Busch is the one consistently contending for wins. Martin Truex the last couple years consistently contending for wins. Denny Hamlin's usually the inconsistent one where he has flashes of brilliance and then moments where you don't know what he's doing. It's been quite the opposite this year. Kyle Busch, Truex, they seem very inconsistent depending on the type of track we're racing at each day, each week. Denny Hamlin, doesn't matter if it's a super speedway, a short track, or, a, or an intermediate like this one, he is up near the front and contending for wins. This is also noteworthy this week because today's race was his first race with Chris Gabehart, his crew chief, back on the top of the pit box after serving that four-race suspension. So clearly, once Denny Hamlin gets matched up with his normal guy, Chris Gabehart, they were tough to beat tonight. That certainly should send a warning message to the rest of the field that the two of them were so dominant tonight. Denny Hamlin winning is great, but let's talk about the rest of these top 20 finishers and some other notable storylines. We'll talk about Chase Elliott finishing second. I want to talk about the finish of this race because Chase Elliott, like I mentioned, ran top five all night long, actually leapfrogged Hamlin during the final cycle of green flag pit stops, but lost the lead when he had to battle Hamlin in lap traffic. And that lap traffic was none other than Joey Logano. Joey Logano had a rough night. Early on, he got some damage on pit road. Then later on, he got loose on a restart and collected Ryan Newman and brought out a caution. So he was a lap down at the time, trying to avoid going two laps down, I guess, but he was racing Chase Elliott very aggressively. While most lap down cars were kind of pulling over and giving the leaders the high lane because it was clear Chase Elliott liked running up near the wall. Rather than get out of his way, Joey Logano stayed right in Chase Elliott's lane, rim riding right there in front of him, but at a much slower pace, screwing Chase Elliott up with the arrow and also, of course, taking Elliott's line away. And that allowed Hamlin to swoop in and basically allowed Denny Hamlin to pass him. Now, Denny Hamlin was closing the gap on Chase Elliott. There's a good chance he might have been able to pass Chase Elliott all on his own, but the two of them seem pretty even down the stretch. I think if Joey Logano does not run in Elliott's line and mess him up for that lap or two, there's a very good chance Chase Elliott would have held, Joey, uh, held Denny Hamlin off at the end of this race, given how equal on speed they seem to be in the final laps. But Joey Logano raced Chase Elliott like a jerk. He did. It was a complete jerky move that you don't usually see from lap traffic late in a race like this, and a lot of fans were wondering why. Let's flash back to Bristol a couple weeks ago when Chase Elliott and Joey Logano were battling for the win at the very end of that race. Chase Elliott blows the corner, four-wheel slides it, and takes both him and Joey Logano out while they were running up front. An over-aggressive mistake 100% on Chase Elliott. Remember, we're talking about at the time how shocked we were that Chase Elliott would make such a mistake, but Joey Logano Logano paid the price for it. Joey Logano did not deserve to get wrecked in that case racing for the win, but he did. And since then, we haven't really seen any significant form of payback from Joey Logano to Chase Elliott, even though I think most people would agree at least something was warranted. It looks like that might have been on the mind of Joey Logano at the end of tonight's race, given how he seemingly got out of the way the moment Denny Hamlin got by Chase Elliott. The moment Hamlin got around Elliott, Logano parked it on the bottom. He was clearly only trying to take away Chase Elliott's line at the end there, likely as a form of retaliation for Chase Elliott wrecking Logano. Logano at Bristol a few races back. So I don't really see any harm in what Logano did there. I think that's fair retaliation and it's relatively harmless. Didn't damage any equipment in the process, just maybe hurt some feelings and obviously rob Chase Elliott of the chance of winning uh, his first race, second race of the season. I don't blame Joey Logano for it given what happened at Bristol, but certainly I think it's safe to say that the way Logano raced Elliott at the end there likely affected the outcome of this race, but I I personally think it was fair game after what happened at Bristol. Looking at some more top finishers, Ryan Blaney, another good day at an intermediate. Let's talk about Tyler Reddick for a moment. The rookie standout this year, and I'm just gonna say it, Tyler Reddick is the most exciting rookie I've seen in the NASCAR Cup Series probably since Kyle Larson. He's maybe close to Chase Elliott. Chase Elliott had very good stats his rookie season, but he wasn't exciting. He didn't win. He didn't really generate a whole lot of conversation besides the fact that he just you know ran pretty well most weeks and made the playoffs as a rookie, which was all impressive, very good. I'm not saying Tyler Reddick's better than Chase Elliott. I'm saying Tyler Reddick is more exciting because he is taking a Richard Childress racing car that ran 25th pretty much all of last year in the points, and he is putting this car in top five, top 10 contention almost on a weekly basis at a fairly wide variety of racetracks. We knew going into this race at Homestead because he'd won the last two races he'd run here in the Xfinity Series, we knew Tyler Reddick was gonna be good at Homestead. I expected a top 10, maybe a top five run, but he consistently drove from the back to the front and stayed up in the top three, top four, almost all night long. Uh, if this race had gone longer, there's a chance he might've had a shot at racing his way up into second or maybe getting up to the lead to battle for the win at the, at the end of this race, but uh, needless to say, a fourth place finish for a rookie at Homestead Miami Speedway is extremely noteworthy. He continues to impress, so shout out to Tyler Reddick. And shout out to his teammate Austin Dillon, also getting a top 10. Richard Childress Racing looks like a playoff team this year. I'm shocked. 2017, 2018, I saw improvement. I was like, okay, RCR might be getting somewhere. And then 2019, just last year, they sucked. Austin Dillon, Daniel Hemrick, they were awful. Super dis big disappointment last season. They have flipped the switch in a major way. So 
so far in 2020, especially since the pandemic, since the hiatus, since we've come back, they have been on it. Austin Dillon's a top 10 threat every week. Tyler Reddick, a rookie, is a top 10 threat every single week at every track. So RCR very well might put two cars in the playoffs this year. Do not count them out. I gotta move a little quicker here. Eric Almarola, very good top five. Nice to see a Stuart Haas racing car not named Kevin Harvick up there in the top five late in this race. I'll give Christopher Bell a shout out. His best career finish to date. Another rookie with a solid run tonight. So hopefully some good momentum being built for that 95 team. Bubba Wallace, a good 13th place finish on the heels of an 11th place finish at Martinsville. A couple very good runs for that 43 team. So once again, momentum is building. Shout out to Michael McDowell, top 15. Another good run for McDowell. He started to pick the pace up. Uh, finishing 16th, Jimmy Johnson. Doesn't look like much, but given he was 25th most of the night, I don't know how he got up to 16th at the end of this thing. I guess they finally figured it out a little bit by the end, but Jimmy Johnson was just way off compared to his teammates all night long. So I'm not sure what happened there, what where they missed on the setup, but that was a little disappointing. Kurt Busch finished the 17th, a rough night for Chip Ganassi Racing. Matt Kenseth was 25th in this race. And Matt Kenseth, he ran great his first race back at Darlington. Remember, he finished 10th with no practice, hadn't been in the car in a year and a half, finished in the top 10. I was like, whoa. But since that impressive top 10 debut, uh, Matt Kenseth and the 42 car have not looked good. And, you know, Kurt Busch has consistently looked better, but even tonight, it looks like neither Chip Ganassi car really had it figured out. So a little bit disappointing given some of the other Chevys ran really well tonight. But uh, yeah, there you go. There's your top 20. Those are your most notable finishers from tonight's race. I guess I'll briefly mention Eric Jones finished 21st after having to pit late in this race with a cut tire. Uh, and Kevin Harvick ended up 26th. He also had a tire issue late in this race. Looked like he hit the wall, cut a tire down. Uh, so I'll mention them. Joey Logano, of course, finished 27th. I mentioned his struggles earlier. Those are your most notable finishers. Let's move on now to uh, talking about this race as a whole, because as per usual, the rules package, the aero package, whatever you want to call it, was at the forefront of the debate. Uh, tonight's race at Homestead Miami Speedway, a mile and a half intermediate, uses the low horsepower, high downforce version of the package, which means there's a big rear spoiler, which creates a big hole in the air, which quite simply put, makes it harder when two drivers are in, in the middle of a turn. It makes it harder for the second place driver to run right behind the first place driver in the exact same lane. It forces that second place driver to change his line a little bit to get clean air on the nose and help his car turn. I overall thought tonight's race was pretty good. Uh, restarts, of course, were fantastic. The first few laps after a restart with this rules package at the intermediates are really good, consistently really good. As is typical with any intermediate track, any type of rules package, of course, the field got pretty strung out during long green flag runs, and we did see a couple long green flag runs tonight, which, of course, leads to less exciting edge of your seat action, typically, but I did think it was really good that at the end of this race, after a long green flag run, after after a set of green flag pit stops with like 20 laps to go, 10 laps to go, the top four were separated by 1.5 seconds. That's a pretty narrow gap, and those are your leaders battling it out down the stretch. I mean, that's noteworthy. It could happen with any rules package, but I do think it was important to note that the finish of this race, even though there wasn't a whole lot of changing for position at the end, was still intense because you had four drivers kind of all running the same line, breathing down each other's necks. Now, that is part of the issue. All four of those drivers, and I'm talking about Hamlin, Chase Elliott, uh, Ryan Blaney, and Tyler Reddick, they all wanted to run right up there around the wall. And the only problem with this current rules package, or I should say the biggest problem with this current rules package at tracks like Homestead Miami Speedway is that, like I said a moment ago, you really can't run in the same line as the guy right in front of you and hope to get much closer than like maybe two car lengths. I mean, we saw Chase Elliott doing a pretty good job of running the exact same line as Hamlin and being able to close the gap. I was impressed. He fought that dirty air pretty well, but it does make it difficult to pass when you're insisting that you run the same line as the guy in front of you. It's probably clear that Chase Elliott knew he was only good around the top, 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 and was wasn't good around the middle or the bottom, so he was kind of stuck running that line. And as long as Hamlin ran that same line and ran it okay, it was going to be tough for Chase Elliott to get back by him. So, dirty air completely came into a, uh, came into play at the end of this race without a doubt, and it's frustrating to see because uh, air. When we're talking about air, it's invisible. You know, NASCAR is a spectator sport. Spectator, you're supposed to watch things. You need something cool to see, and you can't see air. I mean, they say Dale Earnhardt could see the air at super speedways, but most normal mortal beings cannot see air. And if you can't see it, it's hard to you know, root for it or, or really be invested in it. NASCAR has made it clear during their early development of the next gen car, which of course we won't see until 2022, unfortunately, they've made it clear that dirty air is something they are very actively trying to prevent. They've tested things like a rear diffuser. They've tested different types of aero ducts in the front of the car, different size spoilers. All those things NASCAR has been kind of working on in recent months to mitigate the effects of dirty air and really make it easier for drivers to run the same line as each other and like pack air under the spoiler like you used to kind of be able to do back in the day, under the rear of the car, I should say. But uh, 
uh, tonight's rules package I don't think ruined the race by any stretch of the imagination. It was not like the first Pocono race last year where there was literally no jostling for position anywhere in the field, pretty much all race long. It was certainly not that bad, nowhere close, but it did come into play in a couple crucial moments of tonight's race. So that was a little bit frustrating to see, but you know, dirty air is the type of thing that comes into play no matter what rules package you're running. You could be running the high horsepower low down force package that we had like in 2018, dirty air was still talked about. And back then side force was a huge deal. You know, cars were unable to pass because they'd get so unstable. They didn't have enough downforce and too much of it. Like they couldn't pass. They couldn't stay in line like that. And it, it, it resulted in, you know, not great racing either. It's a super difficult balance to strike. It bothers me when I see people on Twitter saying that one or the other is just the obvious answer. Like, oh, well, certainly high horsepower, low downforce is certainly going to work. It's like, well, did you forget 2018 where almost everybody hated every intermediate track outside of Chicago that year? Like, remember that? That sucked. I'm not saying high downforce, low horsepower, like what we had tonight is the answer. It certainly is not on several racetracks, but I think the, the right answer is somewhere in the middle. And I think the next gen car, which of, for, of course we are not going to see for a while now though, uh, is hopefully going to get the best of both worlds involved and will hopefully be a great package on the intermediates. But this stuff is a lot more interesting, a lot more detailed than just spoiler versus horsepower. A lot of people like to just say small spoiler, big horsepower, the opposite, you know, it's more complicated than just what the spoiler and what the what under the hood is packing. You know, there's also the fact that they're running with a tapered spacer right now. That affects the way the cars drive. The fact that it's a 900 horsepower engine being suffocated down to 550 or 750, whatever track they're at. You know, that does affect the way the cars feel and the way the cars drive versus if they were just running a straight up 550 horsepower engine. It would drive differently and it would result in slightly different racing. So my point is it's a lot more detailed than just big spoiler, no spoiler, big horsepower, low horsepower. It, it's more complicated than that. And I think I think what we have right now is not perfect at tracks like Homestead Miami Speedway. It's not awful. Like I said, I think tonight's race was decent. I'll talk about it in a minute, but uh, it's certainly not optimal. And I think hopefully the next gen car, when we get a new engine package and of course a new rules, a new car, uh, I think hopefully a lot of those things will be addressed. But we'll wait and see on that. I didn't mean to turn this into a conversation about rules packages and, and uh, the next gen car, which is still... 18 months away at least. Um, anyway, let's put this race on the groovy gauge. I got sidetracked. It's been a long day, y'all. Well, tonight's race, despite the long green flag runs, I thought was still a pretty interesting race. Like I said a moment ago, at the end of this thing, you still had four drivers within striking distance of one another down the final stretch. Tire wear was a factor. We saw several drivers burning up their right rears at different points, getting into the wall at different points. So the cars weren't just slot cars, just planted to the planted in the corner. You know, the cars took some driving. Driver had to really wheel it at times. I thought there were some pretty good examples of tire strategy, pitch strategy, the way Hamlin and Elliott were able to switch the lead back and forth late in this race. The little bit of petty rivalry between Logano and Elliott at the end coming into play. There were some interesting storylines to follow along tonight. Overall, not not a bad race, not an amazing race, not a, a great race even, but similar to last week or similar to the race at Martinsville, I should say a few days ago, I'm going to give this the same score. I think it's a 65% on the groovy gauge. I think that's what I gave Martinsville a few days ago. Anyway, pretty decent, pretty good race. That's what I would call this. I would have loved to see Chase Elliott really take one more good shot at Denny Hamlin in the closing laps, but uh, that never came to be. Still, it was a tense final 20 or 30 laps or so. It was an exciting race for the most part. A few arrow things, of course, were annoying, but you could tell the driver's still had a lot of input in how they ran. I mean, Tyler Reddick, we know he's great at Homestead, so it's no surprise he's running in the top five. I would have been more concerned if Tyler Reddick, who we know is good at Homestead, was running 20th tonight. That would have been concerning to me. That would have told me that it was all car, no driver at all. And that would have been a little more concerning. But the fact that clearly the drivers who are good at places like Homestead bubbled to the front pretty quickly tells me that the drivers certainly had a, a major role to play in tonight's race, despite some of the little arrow issues that we ran into late in the event. But there's my score on the Groovy Gauge. Let me know what you think on your own personal Groovy Gauges down below in the comments. Thank you all for watching. Long, long day, and I'm sure it's gonna be a long, long week because Talladega is seven days away and I'm excited for it. A busy weekend of action. Arca is back this weekend. They're also racing at Talladega. So a lot of action at that super speedway here in just a few days. I'm gonna be counting down the minutes, counting down the seconds until uh, the super speedways are in action this weekend. But uh, yeah, there you have it. That's all I've got for Homestead. Thank you all for watching. Subscribe if you're new. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Instagram. And of course, a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. I truly appreciate your support. It's thanks to you guys I'm able to continue uploading almost daily on this channel. So I greatly appreciate it. I could not keep updating and keep uh, doing these videos as regularly as I do without the support I get from all of you all on Patreon. So thank you for uh, checking that out. Thank you for supporting the show. There'll be lots to talk about this week, I'm sure. So keep an eye out for some new episodes of Out of the Groove coming out very shortly. Thank you all for watching tonight. Thanks for bearing with the weather all night long. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the show tonight and hope you enjoyed the show right here. Uh, thanks for watching, y'all. I'll see you again very, very soon.